Praise the Lord. Thank you all very much for singing for us this morning. What a simple truth, but an excellent truth. The way to please the Lord is just trust and obey. Trust what he says, obey what he says. And that's a blessing. All right, uh, we'll stand together and uh, fellowship one with another this morning. You children who are seven and under want to go to children's church. You make it the way to the children's church time. Let's all stand together. And she's going to play on the piano. Turn around, shake somebody's hand. Tell me, glad to see them in the house of the Lord this morning. And you that are seven and under be making your way to children's church at this time. to be making your way back to your seat, if you will. I'm glad Jesus saves, Jesus saves, amen. Praise the Lord, Jesus saves. All right, good to fellowship this morning. Thank you so much for that. Songwriter said, in fellowship, sweet, amen. Can't love your brother who you have seen. How can you love God who you have not seen? Amen. John chapter 12, your Bible this morning, John chapter 12. <clears throat> we have been taking a brief look at who Jesus is in each of the chapters of the book of John. <clears throat> Certainly not preaching expositorily from the book of John, not right now. <clears throat> in John chapter 11, we saw Jesus as the resurrection and the life. In John chapter 12, we'll see Jesus as the king. Look at several things today concerning this. John chapter 12, we'll begin reading in verse 12, and we'll read a few verses. We won't read all of the verses but we will read a few of the verses. John chapter 12, look at verse number 12. The Bible says, On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, 
sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and they that had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of the grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing. Behold, the world is gone after him. They must pray together. Father, thank you for the Bible and the opportunity to read just a few verses from this wonderful chapter in the Bible this morning. Thank you for the good singing. Lord, the congregational singing stirred our heart. The young people singing was a tremendous blessing. Thank you for an opportunity to fellowship with God's people. I pray, Lord, that you would help us now as we uh, try to preach. I pray that you would use us to be a blessing. pray you would give us liberty and understanding and the help that we need. Give us the words to say. Help us to say that which is pleasing to you. Help us, Lord, to refrain from saying anything that would be uh, contrary to the Spirit of the Lord or that would cause uh, to grieve the Spirit of God. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, we pray. And for all that you do, we'll certainly love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I realize that the entire book of John and uh, uh, the more, the more I should say, the further that we go along in the book of John, the more I realize that the book of John is devoted to the salvation of mankind through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, every single chapter, and it's been a while uh, we were in John last week, but it's been uh, all the way back in, I think, earlier in the year, even last year, before uh, we had preached any in the book of John uh, lately or recently. But the major theme has been the salvation of sinful man by holy and a sinless God. And, of course, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. In this 12th chapter here of the book of John, Jesus is revealing to the Jews that he is the king that they've been waiting for, but they refuse to believe. In the previous chapter, in John chapter uh, 11, he raised Lazarus from the dead and they will still not believe. The same is true today in large part. Uh, Jesus is still working miracles. We see the miracle of salvation in people's lives. I believe the greatest miracle is the miracle of the new birth, when the Lord takes a, a sinner and gives him life in Christ Jesus, and they begin a brand new life with Christ, and uh, folks can see that, they witness that, there's evidence of that in people's lives, and yet people still today fail to believe the message and the miracle of salvation and the goodness of God in the lives of others, and they could certainly know that life in their own life as well. So we'll look at several things today with the help of the Lord concerning Jesus the King. Now I began reading just a moment ago in verse number 12 and that is a section of scripture that begins talking about his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So what we see here in this first section, these few verses that are read, is the presentation of the King. Now we see in that the presentation of the King, we see the method of of his presentation. Look at verse 14. The Bible says, And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, set thereon, for it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. So Jesus came in Jerusalem riding an ass, riding a donkey, a colt, if you will, and he done that to fulfill the prophecy. This it says, as it is written. This is written in, in Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. If you'd like to turn, well, I'll just read it for you. It, it says there in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt, the fold of an ass. So, he did this so the Jews, these Jews who believe the Old Testament Scripture would recognize and realize that this was indeed the King of Israel. The Bible says, we have this here in John, but come backwards, if you will, to Luke chapter 19 for just a moment. Luke chapter 19. We'll look at this again. 
Luke chapter 19, we're talking about the method of his presentation. He came riding a donkey. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 19, verse 28. There's a whole lot of preaching about the, the donkey and, and all of that kind of stuff. But I'm just trying to, to show you today who Jesus is. Look at verse 28. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19, And when he had thus spoken, he went before, ascending up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he was come nigh to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, verse 30, saying, Go ye into the village over against you, in the which at your entering you shall find a colt tied, whereon yet never man set. Loose him and bring him thither. And if any man asks you, Why do you loose him? Thus shall you say unto him, because the Lord hath need of him. And so the Lord had need of this donkey, and he sent these disciples to get the donkey, and he is riding this donkey into Jerusalem. They're expecting a king, but they are not expecting a king coming riding a donkey. They're expecting a king who is going to have some kind of military might or some political power, and he's going to deliver them from the Roman Empire. That's what they're wanting. But what they're getting is a king that's coming meek and lowly, and he is riding on a donkey. I'm sure that they are expecting the king to come and with all of his pomp and, and all of his circumstance and all of his all of his glory and all, all but that's not how Jesus came the first time. He came to die for the sins of mankind. What a blessing. And so we see the method of his presentation. Now look at the many people. Look how many people there were who gathered there at this presentation. Look at verse number nine. It begins with this this phrase much people of the Jews. Look at, look at verse number 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. So they're, they're laying out the red carpet for him, if you will. They're laying out these palm trees. The Bible tells us in another place that we may read in a moment that they laid down their garments for him as well. And so they're, th this is the king. The king is coming. The Bible says, blessed is the king of Israel in verse number 13. And so it goes on to say in verse number uh, 12, and they went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of of the Lord. So there were much people. Look what the Bible says in Matthew. Come to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21 and verse number 6. In Matthew chapter 21, verse number 6, the Bible says, And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the coal, and put them put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. Now, look at verse number 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. Verse 9 says, And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So the Bible tells us in Matthew that there was multitudes, that there was a great multitude of people. In our text in John chapter 12, it says that there was much people. However, they were not looking. They, they, were, they were looking. they were not looking for a king that was coming to offer them salvation for their souls. They were looking for salvation from the Roman Empire. They were looking for a, an earthly leader. They, listen, people in America, they're not looking for the Savior either. They're not looking for salvation. They're also looking from, for some kind of political leader or some kind of military leader. Our nation is in trouble. We're in a mess spiritually and morally and, and in all other kind of ways as well. And there's not, doesn't seem to be many Americans who are looking to God for salvation. They're looking to some some man or some group or some uh, one branch of the government or the other. I'll tell you what we need. We need Jesus, amen. They needed Jesus. We needed Jesus. And there are multitudes who are in need of him today. Now, when they found out that Jesus was not coming uh, to overthrow the Roman government, 
Many of the same crowd that here on this day, they, they cut down the palm branches, they laid out their clothes, and they were crying, Hosanna to the king of Israel. Many that were present on this day were also in present in John 19, just five days later, and many of the same crowd that were crying, Hosanna to the king, were crying, crucify him, just five days later. Listen, I want to tell you, it is amazing how fast people turn away from God, turn away from the things of the Lord, and as soon as things don't go their way, or as soon as things don't work out the way that they think they should, or as soon as uh, they get a little bad taste, they, they just turn away from the Lord and the things of God. And so we see here, these people, the Lord didn't turn out to be what they wanted, and so they cried, crucify him just a few days later. And so we see the presentation of the king, and we also see the purpose of the king. Look at verse number 20, the purpose of of the king. The Bible says in verse number 20, and I should read a very lengthy passage of scripture here. It goes all the way down through verse number 32. And uh, so I'll just read it. The Bible says in verse number 20, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this will the prince of the, shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. So we see, first of all, the presentation of the king. We see, second of all, the purpose of the king. And one of the purposes of the king, there are many, and we'll just mention a few from this passage of scripture, is to die for sin. Look at verse 24. You see what it said? Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Jesus here is explaining to his disciples that he must die for the sins of mankind. And so he uses a very simple example here to try to get them to understand. If, if, a, if a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, when it comes up, that thing brings forth plenty. Jesus is saying that I am, must die, I'll be buried, I'll rise again from the dead, and because of that, many are going to live. What a blessing. Now, skip down to verse 27. He said, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But, but, for this cause came I unto this hour. He began praying and he said, save me from this hour. But then he said, but for this cause came I unto this hour. So Jesus' ministry on earth was, uh, was not about his preaching, though he was the greatest of preachers. Jesus' ministry upon earth was not about his miracles, though he performed many miracles and great miracles and, and wonderful things were accomplished because of his miracles. But his purpose for coming to this earth was to die on the cross of Calvary for sinful man. Look what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. He was the greatest of preachers. He was the greatest miracle worker. But his primary purpose was to die for the sins of the world. Look at Matthew chapter 20 and verse number 28. Matthew 20 verse 28, Jesus doing the speaking. It says, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. Look what it says. 
and to give his life a ransom for many. What a blessing. The Bible says in Luke chapter 19, Jesus said in verse number 10, he said, well, the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. We know the passage well in John chapter 3 and verse number 17. The Bible says, for God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse number 10, he said, the thief cometh uh, but for to steal and to kill and destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus said in John chapter 12, in this same chapter that we're in, and verse number 47, he said, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. Notice this last phrase. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Hey, the great apostle Paul in 1 Timothy uh, said in chapter 1 and verse number 15, he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. So we know that Christ Jesus came to die for the sins of the world. We know that the Jews rejected Jesus, but if the Jews had received the Lord Jesus Christ, he still would have died for sin. You know why the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13 and verse number 8, it talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, I believe it is. Uh, yeah, it says, I, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin or no remission. And so Jesus had not died, had not shed his blood, had not rose again from the dead. Salvation would not be possible. But I'm glad that he was willing to come and to give his life so that you and I could be saved. I praise the Lord that he died for us. Romans 5, 12 said, But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, look at verse 32. The purpose of the king is to die for sin. The purpose of the king is to draw men unto himself. Look what the Bible says in verse 32. Jesus speaking again. He said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, We'll draw all men unto me. Now you and I know that Jesus is talking about his death on the cross. He's being lifted up from the earth and he's speaking of him being crucified. Jesus said, I mentioned John chapter 3 and verse 17 a moment ago. Look, look at John chapter 3 and verse 14. I could probably quote it. I turn there and read it with you. Look what Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 14. He said something very Similar, similar to what he said in verse 32 of John chapter 12. He said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, why must the Son of Man be lifted up? Look at verse 15. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Listen, there's something very powerful about the cross. There's something uh, very powerful about the preaching of the cross. When, when we realize that we are sinful, when we realize that we are away from God, we realize that we're ungodly, we realize that we're separated from God, we realize that our sin has separated from God, there is something very powerful about the preaching of a cross and a man who loved mankind enough that he would give his life and shed his blood and suffer the cruel punishment and the beating so that we could be saved by the grace of God. What a blessing it is. Listen, we must reach the place in our lives that the cross becomes attractive to you and I. It is then that we begin to desire the Savior. Listen, you never realize that you're lost. You never realize that you're going to spend eternity separated from God in hell or, or in the lake of fire for all eternity. You don't realize that you're guilty before God. You don't understand that your sin has caused you to be an enemy to God. You, have to, you, you realize those things. You desire to have a relationship with Him. You're attracted to Him and He has been lifted up so that lost mankind can see the Savior dying for the sins of the world. Listen, He did what no one else could do. He suffered and died. The preaching of Christ's death on the cross still has the power to move men. We're talking about in this passage of Scripture, He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. I'm thankful that the preaching of the cross still draws people 
to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to ask you this. Has the preaching of the cross ever drawn you? Amen. The preaching of the, has, has the preaching of the gospel ever drawn you to the Lord Jesus Christ? You ever seen yourself in need of a Savior? You ever seen yourself lost and separated from God and in need of a Savior? I'm glad that when you see that, the preaching of the cross will draw you to Himself. Listen, the desire of the Lord for every man is that they'll be saved. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9 that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so it is the Lord's desire that you come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the king was to die for sin. It was to draw men to Himself. It was to create life in us. Look at verse number 23 again. Look at John chapter 12. Look at verse 23. The Bible says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I've mentioned this verse a couple of times already. I'll mention it again, verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And so we, we see oftentimes this death of Christ. Many folks view the death of Christ as being brutal and gruesome and bloody, and it certainly was. But it was a glorious thing for you and I. In fact, the Bible, the Lord himself said uh, in, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He certainly did not endure, enjoy the punishment. He didn't enjoy uh, the ridicule. He didn't enjoy the slander. He, did, he didn't enjoy God turning his back on him, but he endured the cross because the joy that was set before him, and that was that you and I would have an opportunity to receive him as our Savior. And so the, by that verse goes on to say, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the glory of God. So Jesus had no joy in his suffering and death on the cross, but he endured it because of the end result. And that's the fact that sinners could be reconciled to God. He also viewed his death as a time of glory. It's mentioned here. It's mentioned again in Romans. Look at Romans chapter number 4. He viewed his death as a time of glory because he didn't plan on staying dead. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Look at Romans chapter 4. By his resurrection, Jesus opened the way for all men to be justified. Look, the Bible says in Romans 4.25, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Listen, the gospel message is incomplete without the resurrection. And I'm thankful that he rose again for our justification. We are made just, just as though we have never sinned. What a blessing. Romans 10, 9 says, It's even part of the salvation message that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart, what? That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This is what, this, you say, why? Here in, in John chapter 12, Jesus is, is repeating the fact that he is going to die for man and proof that he's going to rise again is in John chapter 11, he rose Lazarus from the dead. And he said, look, I, I'm going to rise from the dead as well. What a blessing. He gave us a living example in the person of Lazarus in the previous chapter. Lazarus was living an impossible life. He was dead. He was buried. He was gone as far as mankind was concerned. But his situation was not too hard and not impossible for the Lord Jesus Christ. He raised him from the dead. He gave him life again. It's a, it's a picture of you and I who are dead in our trespass and sin. We have, we have no spiritual life. We have no relationship with God. We, we are of our father, the devil. But Jesus, because uh, died for our sin, our faith in him, he makes us a new creature in Christ Jesus. We become a son of God. Can you believe that? We are born again, made a new creature creation in Christ. We, we move from the devil being our father to you and I being a son of God because our Savior died for our sin and rose again for our justification. What a blessing. Listen, we, we can have this abundant life that Jesus talks about in John chapter 10 and verse number 10. If we want it, something come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And so we have the presentation of the king. 
He came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. He wasn't riding in some glamorous, glorious chariot. We have the, the purpose of the king to be lifted up from this earth and to die for sinful man. And then we have the people or the crowd, the people that was against the king. There's always people who are against the gospel message. They rejected his message. Look at verse 34. Look at verse 34. They rejected his message. The people answered him, John 12, verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. How And how sayest thou the Son must be lifted up? Now, I've mentioned already, and it's mentioned a couple more times in this chapter, and, and I've mentioned already as well, when Jesus spoke of being lifted up, they knew that he was talking about the crucifixion. What they could not believe or understand was that their king had to die and be raised again from the dead. Now, Jesus' message was, I, I'm going to die for your sin, but they rejected that message. There, there's folks today, many, many folks today are rejecting the message that Jesus Christ has died for their sin, and he's the only way of salvation. He's the, he's the only hope of eternal life, eternal life. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. There's not, there's not another way. There's not an alternate route. It's not, it's not like you're riding down the road and you're looking at your GPS and, and it shows the traffic backed up ahead and it gives you an alternate route. No, Jesus is the only way. There, there's not another way. There's, they, they rejected that message. Many today, they, they, they don't like this path. They don't like this way. And so they're trying to go some other way. The Bible says when they do that, they are the same as a, as a, a, a thief and a liar. You, you can't go up any other way. Jesus is the only way. And so they are rejecting the message of love that Jesus had to them. You say, a message of love. Yeah, what, what greater love is it that, that God would lay down his life for sinful man? He is the only hope that we have. You, you know, the, I want to show you something. This is, look, come to Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. If we reject the message that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, there is no other Way. Look, look at this verse of Scripture. I want to show you this. If we reject the message of love through the cross of the Lord Jesus, there's no hope for us. Look at this verse of Scripture. Now I understand that there's people everywhere who use this verse of Scripture that I'm about to read to say that you can lose your salvation. But that has nothing to do with this verse at all whatsoever. Look at Hebrews 10, 26. Look what it says. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Listen, if you receive the knowledge, you receive the truth that Jesus Christ is the only way and the only hope of salvation, there is, there is no other way, there is no alternative way, and you reject that truth, there is no more sacrifice for sins. He, he's the only sacrifice for sins. There is not another sacrifice for sin. He is the only sacrifice for sin. So many in that day rejected the message of the cross, and many in our day reject the message as well. So we see the people against the king, they rejected his message. Come back to John chapter 12. Not only did they reject his message, they rejected his ministry. Look at verse number 34 again. The Bible says, The people answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. How sayest thou the Son of Man must be lifted up? Now, look at this question. Who is the Son of Man? Now, they've heard all of his preaching. They've heard all of his teaching. They've witnessed all of these miracles that's been mentioned in the Gospel of John up to here, and yet they are still in unbelief. They say, who is this man? I, I was thinking about this earlier this week. I was studying uh, this passage of scripture in John chapter 12, and, and I had this thought, and they say, who is this man? It gave me the idea that they were mocking him, to have, to have this kind of, who is this? I mean, they, they've heard his preaching. They've heard his teaching. They, they know that he raised Lazarus from the dead. It's in chapter number 12 where we are that he's done so. And, and yet they, they say, who is this man? You know, folks today, they, 
They hear the, they hear the message. They saw evidence in other people's lives. They, they hear the preaching. They, some have even read the Bible. Some have read the gospel tracts. And, and they've heard the truth. And they know the truth. And, and yet they are so set on themselves and against God that they have the same kind of, of attitude as, who is this man? Or, the way it's put in our vernacular in the day that we live, who does this man think he is? He's God. That's who he is. He, he is the Savior. They refuse to believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation and the only hope of heaven and eternal life. And the men all over the world today are still doing the same thing. They hear the gospel message over and over and over again, and yet they reject the message and they still reject Jesus. And I tell you, in their heart, what they're saying is, I'm, I will not have this man rule over me. Listen, I, it's, it's been repeated numerous times, but Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth. Acts 4 verse 12 said, neither is there salvation in any other. There's, there's no other way. It's going to be Jesus or it's not going to be. So the people against the Jews, they rejected his message. They rejected his ministry. Look at this. They rejected his miracles. Look at verse 37. Look at verse 37. But though he had done, look what it says, so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. I don't know how many miracles. The Bible says at the end of the Gospel of John that if everything that he had done was recorded, the world wouldn't be able to hold the, to hold the books. And so we have several, I think there's 38 miracles recorded in the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ, if I'm not mistaken. And I hope I remember that correctly. And so we don't know how many miracles. The Bible says here that though he had done so many miracles before him, they, before them, they were witnesses of all the miracles that he had, uh, that we have preached about and that we have seen in the Gospel of John and others probably as well. They have witnessed his power to change lives. I, I believe that they have even had conviction in their own heart of who this man was and, and what he had come to do for them. And, and yet they still refuse to believe. The Bible said, yet they believed not on him. There's many today, they're following that same path. They refuse to believe on him. They know about him. They know all about what he's done. They've heard all about what he's done. They've heard all about what he's doing. They've heard all about what he's capable of doing, but they have no interest in believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, I'll tell you, if you're here today and you're not saved, I don't know what your excuse is, but it will not stand when you stand before God. I, I, don't, I don't care what it is that you think is acceptable, that you can get around, or that God will make an exception for you. And I've, I've even heard people very pridefully say that, uh, well, me and God's got it all worked out. No, you don't. It's His way or no way. We, we come by the way of the cross or we don't come at all. We, we come receiving the message of the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ or we don't come at all. Amen. Amen. And so they rejected His ministry. They rejected His message and they rejected His miracles. Now we saw, we've seen the presentation of the king, the purpose of the king, the people who were against the king. Now come to the end of the chapter and I'll show you just briefly, just quickly, the promise of the king. The promises, maybe I should say, more than one, of the king. In verse number 44, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth not on he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judge him the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father saith unto me, so I speak. And so first of all, the promise of the king is the promise of revelation. We will see God because Jesus is God. Amen. What a blessing. We see that in verse 44. And uh, But on him that sent me, said, he that seeth me, verse 45, 
See of him that sent me. I, I'm glad. You know, the Bible says in John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 said, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. I'm glad that Jesus is God. I don't have no problem with that at all whatsoever, amen. I like the passage in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 8 where it says, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God. So in that same passage, he is referred to as the Son and God. Why? Because he is the Son and he is God. Amen. What a blessing. So listen, if you want to meet God, it can only be done through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Amen. So we see the promise of revelation. We see the promise of release. Look at verse 46. He said, I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. I'm glad receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior will free you from the darkness of sin. I'm glad that salvation will free you from the penalty of of sin. What a blessing that is. I, listen, I, we are daily being freed from the power of sin by sanctification. And one of these days, we're going to be freed from the presence of sin by glorification when the Lord comes to get us. So I, I, we've seen in that song just a moment ago, Sweet Hour of Prayer. My favorite line in that song is about when this robe of flesh will be dropped and I'm going to rise to meet the Lord in the air. What a glorious time that's going to be. I have been saved. I am being saved and I'm going to be saved. Amen. What a blessing. So we see the promise of relief. Jesus is the only one who has the power to free us from the chains of sin. He alone can take any wick, wicked, sinful person and make them a new creature in Christ Jesus. Jesus said in John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free Indeed, I'm glad that I am, have been freed from the penalty of sin through the Lord Jesus Christ. So the promise of the king, there's the promise of the revelation, the promise of relief, and also the promise of rescue. We could go on I, I, in those last verses of John chapter 12. I, I am so thankful that I am not going to stand before God condemned for my sin. Not because I don't deserve to, but because I've been forgiven. And I'm glad you too can be forgiven. If you'll place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be forgiven. Jesus is the king. The Jews can say whatever they want to. Jesus is still the king. The people today, they can say anything that they want to, but Jesus is still the king. He came, he came into this world in a lowly fashion, born in a manger, born of a virgin. He came into Jerusalem on his triumphal entry, riding on a donkey. But one of these days, he is coming back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. What a blessing. Keisha, come to the piano today, if she will. I'll give you just a couple of minutes to respond to the invitation today. I'm glad Jesus is the King. If you don't know him, you can know him today. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're here today and you're not saved, and you've realized that your sin has separated you from God, He'll save you if you'll put your faith and your trust in Him. <clears throat> this morning, we'd like to come.
Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the preaching of your word. Thank you for the word of God. I'm glad, Lord, that you promised us that it would not return void. Oftentimes, Lord, we can't see immediately the effects of your word. Sometimes we grow discouraged and despondent. And then, Lord, we find out later that the seed was planted and someone watered and God gave the increase and folks were saved. We've seen evidence of that even this week. And Lord, that's a tremendous blessing. We thank you for it. I pray the word that went forth today, Lord, would be a seed planted in someone's heart. Maybe tomorrow, maybe this afternoon, maybe down the road, someone would water that seed. And Lord, you'd give the increase. And someone would come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for loving us, being good to us. Thank you for all that you do for us in Jesus' name. Amen.